Uh, our first speaker tonight is Dr. Joel Levine. He is currently a research professor in the Department of Applied Science at the College of William and Mary, following a 41-year career at NASA. So he knows a lot of stuff. We are also proud to say that he is a founding member of our Science Matters leadership team. Joel believes that as humans, we have an innate urge for exploration and discovery. It's kind of wired into our genes, is what he thinks. His, lo his love of astronomy and planets started when he was in the sixth grade in Brooklyn, New York, when he saw color photographs of Mars that were taken by an astronomical telescope. And that's when he became interested in Mars and has spent almost five decades pursuing this interest and contributing to science in this field. He started with a Bachelor of Science degree in physics and a minor in astronomy from Brooklyn College of the City University of New York. He followed that with multiple master's degrees from NYU and the University of Michigan, and then a doctorate in atmospheric science from the University of Michigan. During his years at NASA, he was a senior research scientist at NASA Langley Research Center and the Mars Scout Program Scientist in the Mars Exploration Program at NASA Headquarters in DC. He was awarded a Virginia Outstanding Scientist Award in 1987 and just this year, which is the 100th anniversary of NASA Langley Research Center, he was installed as the youngest member of the NASA Hall of Honor for his research on the origin and evolution of the atmospheres of Earth and Mars and for his numerous contributions to the United States exploration of Mars. It's pretty studly. Tonight, Dr. Levine will be discussing becoming a two-planet species, why humans, why Mars, the subject of his extremely popular TED Talk. Please help me welcome Dr. Joel Levine. Thank you, Catherine. It's, uh, it's true, when I was uh, in the sixth grade at PS 182 in Brooklyn, New York, I saw color pictures of Mars taken with the new Mount Wilson 100-inch telescope, then the largest telescope in the world. And I remember seeing that in the sixth grade. And recently, because everything's on the internet, I actually found those pictures that I saw in the sixth grade. Now, the only downside is, is my wife, Arlene, who had a 27-year career at NASA, points out that I probably haven't uh, evolved much since the sixth grade, because <laughs> for the last uh, 50 years, I've been doing the same thing, that's studying planet Mars. It, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have so many people in the audience, so many people on the waiting list, uh, the US, is number 25 in science literacy in the world, that we should be one or two or three, and Science Matters and this station is doing everything it can to raise our standing, and this event is just one of them. So what I'd like to talk about is uh, the human exploration of Mars, why Mars, why humans? And let me start with the cover of a NASA report this is called The Human Exploration of Mars, a Design Reference Architecture, number five. There were four previous reports that didn't go anywhere. This report came out in 2009. This is the front page of the report. This report is online. You can download it. It's Human Exploration of Mars, Design Reference Architecture 5.0. So if you go at nasa.gov, look under exploration, you can actually download this report. This is the back cover of the report. I like this picture, so I wanted to include it. Several years ago, when NASA decided that a major future goal for not only NASA, but the United States of America would be to send astronauts to Mars and return them safely, there were a number of reasons proposed why we want to do this. And uh, one of the reasons was uh, 
scientific exploration. And the question is, are there things uh, on Mars that can be done, that cannot be done by robotic missions, which are much cheaper and safer, than can be done, that just couldn't be done by robotic missions, but could be done by humans, human explorers on the surface. So NASA formed a panel, it's called Human Exploration of Mars Science Analysis Group. I was, uh, I was privileged to be the, one of the two co-chairs of the panel, and we formed a committee, this is a, not an eye test, I just want to give credit to the people, <laughs> I want to give credit to the people who worked on this with me for four years. Uh, this represents probably the, the expertise of Mars in the United States and Europe, the top Mars scientists are listed, and their institutions. And what we did is we published our results in a 974 page book, The Human Mission to Mars, Colonizing the Red Planet, and uh, we, all of our results are in this book. And uh, what I want to do is give you a, an 18 minute summary of what we found, because I only have 20 minutes. <laughs> Why Mars? And it turns out that the committee meeting for four years, the Human Exploration of Mars Science, Science Analysis Group, came up with about 150 questions that are very relevant that we didn't think can be solved by robotic missions. But I want to talk about the two overriding questions uh, on why we want to send humans to Mars. And the first overriding question, is there past and or present life on Mars? This is a very fundamental question in all of science. And to find life outside the Earth would be an, an, an amazing discovery, especially since we have the opportunity to analyze it on a molecular level, on a biochemical level, on a metabolic level, and see how life that formed outside planet Earth is similar and different to life that evolved on our planet. And I think that, I, I personally believe we will find life outside the Earth in the next five years. And uh, there, there's suggestions that there may be microbial life on Mars today. And I think that once we bring home samples of life outside the Earth, life that's indigenous to Mars or, or Titan or Europa, wherever we go, I think it will be a fundamental advancement in our understanding of biology, of how we fight diseases, of human health, and it will transcend planetary science. So the first overarching question, is there life on Mars past or present? And the conclusion of the panel was that a robotic mission could not do it. And, and we can talk about it during questions and answers. The second overarching question is what happened on Mars? And by that I mean, we have evidence that Mars underwent catastrophic climate change. Earth and Mars, the Sun, the rest of the solar system were formed 4.7 billion years ago. It's a Tuesday that all of these. <laughs> and we know that on early Mars, early Mars was very different than it is today. Early Mars had an ocean that covered a third of the northern hemisphere. It was about three miles uh, thick, water to a depth of three miles. We know that early Mars had rivers. We know that early Mars had lakes. We also know that early Mars had a thick atmosphere compared to Mars today. Today, Mars has no liquid water. Mars has a very thin atmosphere. The pressure of the Earth's atmosphere at the surface is 1,013 millibars. The pressure of the atmosphere on Mars is six millibars. It's like the Earth's atmosphere is at 20 miles above the surface. And something happened on Mars to change it from a very Earth-like habitable planet to a very desolate, uh, inhospitable planet. And the question is, what happened and can this happen on Earth in the future? 
This is an artist's conception of the ocean on early Mars. The northern hemisphere of Mars was covered by water to a depth of three to uh, four miles, and somehow that ocean disappeared, and the lakes disappeared, and the rivers disappeared. <coughs> However, the history of Mars climate and what caused its change and, and, and the factors that affect the climate may be on Mars right now. In ice cores at the North Pole and South Pole, at the Arctic and Antarctic, we have analyzed the trapped gas in those ice cores. When ice forms on the surface, it's porous and it traps part of the atmosphere, the, the gases in the atmosphere. And we've gone back millions of years in studying the Earth, and we've reconstructed the composition and the temperature and the climatology of the Earth's atmosphere. Well, Mars has polar caps at the North Pole and South Pole. This is the North Polar ice cap. The, most of this ice at the North Pole is frozen water, and it, there's a veneer of frozen carbon dioxide at, on, on, on the top. But there are places on Mars that may have the whole climate history of Mars today, and it just requires us getting core samples, doing the analysis, and studying the evolution of the atmosphere on Mars. Why humans? Humans possess many unique characteristics. Intelligence, ingenuity, adaptability, agility, dexterity, uh, mobility, and also speed and efficiency. Unfortunately, the robotic missions that we've sent to Mars, and I've, I've worked on uh, a dozen of the missions that we sent to Mars, do not have these traits. They have to be programmed <coughs> for, uh, in great detail for everything that they do, and if there's a new situation that we didn't know about, it will invalidate many of the experiments that are on the surface of Mars. So humans have characteristics that we cannot build into robotic missions. We project it out to the year 2050, and the technologists on our panel didn't think by 2050 or 2060 we could, do, we, we could develop these for robotic missions. Let me just talk about mobility. <clears throat> the National Academy of Science says the most important parameter in exploring planets is mobility, the ability to get around the planet. Now, we have actually NASA's Mars Exploration Rover Opportunity. Two years ago, it completed a Mars marathon. It covered 26.2 miles, but unfortunately, it took 11 years to do that. And what we're planning for the human mission to Mars is a, a vehicle <coughs> that will have the ability <coughs> to cover hundreds of miles in one day. Why become a two-planet species? When we land on Mars, and we're talking about the 2030s right now, we will become the uh, first species in the history of humankind to actually be a two-planet species. And there are a number of reasons to do this. One of them has to do with the future of life on Earth. There are a number of threats there is on Earth. Catastrophic uh, climate change. I, I happen to believe that global warming is real. It was not made up by the Chinese. And uh, uh, we, we, humans are altering the environment. Another concern is synthetic biology experiments or a national pandemic, a natural pandemic that can impact large regions on the earth and lead to destruction of large numbers of people. And finally, cosmic impacts. It's not a question of if a cosmic impact will happen. The question is when will it happen? The moon was formed three and a half billion years ago when a Mars-sized object collided with the earth and put a large chunk of the Earth orbiting around the Earth, and eventually it became the Moon. We look at the solar system. We see on Mars uh, the uh, Hellas Basin 
that's 3,000 miles across caused by an impact. So it's not a question of when it will happen. Uh, it's, it's not will it happen, it's when it will happen. Cosmic impacts are due to comets, asteroids, and meteors. And uh, two years ago, an asteroid passed within 3.1 times the distance uh, from the Earth to the moon. That's 240,000 miles. So we had an asteroid come about uh, 750,000 miles, and this was considered a, a near miss. And unfortunately, there are thousands of asteroids, chunks of material from the beginning of the solar system orbiting very close to the Earth. This is an artist's uh, conception. Every dot is an asteroid. You see in the middle the yellow thing, it's called the Sun, and Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and out in the corner on the left is Jupiter, and those are all orbits of asteroids. And the scary thing is that there are millions of asteroids that we haven't yet mapped out its orbit, so we don't know, uh, you know w w where they are. Uh, let me show you something that happened in northern Russia two years ago. This was a camera recorder on, a, uh, on an automobile dashboard. This is a chunk of an asteroid that came into northern Russia. It destroyed windows in hundreds of buildings. The object itself ended up in a lake. Okay, we, we're interested in getting to Mars for scientific reasons and also as a, a, a future safe haven. Let's talk about future Mars. What we're looking at, or scientists are looking at, are not doing but looking at computer models of how to make Mars habitable for future human habitability. And th there, are, there are some guidelines, some ideas, how to make Mars habitable. We know there's a lot of water and a lot of carbon dioxide frozen below the surface of Mars. If you place a large solar reflector in orbit around Mars, point it to Mars, it will heat up the surface, it will cause the frozen water and the frozen carbon dioxide to become gaseous and enter the atmosphere. As some of you know, both water vapor and carbon dioxide are very strong greenhouse effect uh, gases and will lead to a warming of the planet. Once the planet heats up, you seed the surface with photosynthetic plants. Photosynthetic plants have the ability to take carbon dioxide, the main gas in the atmosphere of Mars, and through metabolic processes, turn it into oxygen. That's how we got oxygen on Earth. And by seeding the surface of Mars with photosynthetic plants, we can develop oxygen on Mars. Once we have oxygen, we will uh, automatically form a protective ozone layer on Mars to block out the ultraviolet radiation that's deadly to living systems. And then finally, once we have a warmer Mars and we have ozone in the atmosphere and oxygen in the atmosphere, liquid water could once again exist on the surface. And let me show you an artist's conception. This is Mars today and we're terraforming Mars to make it uh, Earth-like. Stephen Hawking, a, a brilliant mind uh, who has studied the origin of the universe, the origin of uh, the solar system, how life formed on this planet, has said that the human race has no future if it does not go into space, meaning the human race uh, go into space and uh, and, and, and form uh, locations on other worlds. Uh, my last chart is going to show you how we think we will send humans to Mars. The first part of this is an actual NASA video clip of the first test of the space launch system, which will get astronauts to Mars. You'll hear more about this in a few minutes from my other two, from our other two speakers. Two, one, and liftoff at dawn, the dawn of Orion and a new era of American space exploration. Good chamber pressure in all three boosters in the full power mode. 
This is the SLS, Space Launch System, an early version of it. Everything else now is from a graphic artist. And we have the Orion space capsule carrying the crew that's meeting a transfer vehicle. It takes nine months to get to Mars. It will travel 250 million miles at least in that nine month period. It will enter the atmosphere of Mars. Parachutes will slow it down. Retro rockets will slow it down to terminal velocity. And then the astronauts will leave <coughs> the spacecraft look around Mars, spend 500 days, that's the current plan, 500, plane, 500 days on the surface, looking for evidence for life, looking for evidence about climate change. Then there will be a small ascent rocket that will take the crew uh, back up around Mars where there's an, an orbiting spacecraft waiting for them. Then they'll get back to, uh, to Earth. So this is the plan. We're developing this. The, the plan for terraforming Mars is, is, not, is not a program. It's just a, a paper exercise at this point. But we are in the midst of preparing for probably the most exciting journey in the history of the human race, sending astronauts to planet Mars and returning them safely to Earth. Thank you very much. <laughs>